Okay, all of you can hear me out there, I guess. I'm speaking on a cell phone. So I've got, you know, like, you know, in Nehemiah's day, they had, uh, I guess, one hand on a, uh, on a sword and another hand on a cell phone. That's how I'm operating right now. So you're getting to hear a message anyway. And uh, you don't get to see whatever flashy outfit I'm wearing. So a uh, uh, good Sabbath to everybody out there. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to everybody. And this is being recorded, so some of you may be... Apologize. Evidently, I didn't get my uh, my topic in uh, early enough to, to uh, you know, so that you would uh, know what it is. So I'll keep you in suspense even a little longer. Uh, I'd like to uh, just make a comment about the general uh, season of the year uh, in America. You know, we have a certain tradition about summer. Uh, you know, traditionally it's vacation time and so forth. Um, in the uh, Bible, though, this season of the year, midsummer, historically uh, is a very sober time. And uh, in the Jewish community, this period of time, uh, we use the expression that you find in uh, Lamentations, Bein Hamid Sarim, it's the time between the straits. It's a it's a stressful time in terms of the his, the historic the history of the church history of God's people over the centuries, and it culminates uh, very soon in the commemoration of the destruction of both temples. And uh, even as I speak, there's tension uh, over in Israel on the Temple Mount, uh, which often occurs at this season of the year. Unfortunately, um, uh, I'll tell. I hadn't planned to, to tell, it really is not directly related to my talk, but back in 1970, a long time ago, I w it was the 9th of Av, we were, you know, observing the fast in Jerusalem and uh, wailing at the wall, the Western Wall, you know, reading the Book of Lamentations. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, during the daytime, we were there and there was this uh, Nash Ultra, this hawk, you could call him, you know, the zealot. And he was there with us. And he looked up. We, we were down, of course, by the Western Wall. And he looked up at the Temple Mount. And he said, Maspit Lamata, Lamala. He said, we've been down here long enough. Let's go up there. And I felt like, tell I want to start World War Three, You know, uh, but anyway, so the, unfortunately, it's uh, a very tense uh, situation over there. So we could... Uh, as the Bible says, pray for the peace of, uh, of Jerusalem. But I wanted to uh, go to Hebrews 4 and verse 12. It says, the word, this is Hebrews 4, 12. There's a tremendous power in God's word. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. You, you obviously have respect for God's word or you wouldn't be listening. There's a tremendous power in God's word. And God's word can be taken... Uh, there's a basic level that anybody can understand, you know. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. Well, actually, you shall not murder comes first, right? You shall not murder. You shall not steal. And so forth. Very basic. And the accounts, the historical accounts are very basic. David and Goliath and so on. There, there's a certain basis you can, take, you can take it on. On the other hand, there's tremendous complexity in the Bible. All kinds of patterns working and uh, all kinds of levels of, of understanding and the complexity is is awesome and uh there are people who don't who aren't even uh believers in 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 god who spend their lives studying the bible because it's so fascinating to them and you would think that they would get some idea that maybe there is some special inspiration involved behind the bible if they're willing to to, to spend their lifetime studying it uh and certainly the the tremendous uh, patterns that you find in the Bible and the various levels of understanding are indicative of the of the uh, power of of the, the, the of the being who inspired the words. Uh, hey, just a brief introduction to literary techniques in the Bible. Just a few of the kind of of things you can find when you go beneath the surface. You know, just literary techniques in the Bible because God wants to reach us in various ways. You know, however He can do it. He wants to impact us, and people can be impacted different ways. Some people are into language, some people are into numbers, people are into science, people are into history, you know, people are into art, music, you know, whatever way, and God is going to reach us. 
For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's a tremendous power in God's word. And um, in fact, there's a, <laughs> a congregation that I was attending recently that had a very, very famous quotation from Paul Harvey. And he said, the problem that most people have with the Bible is not that it contradicts themselves, but that it contradicts itself, but that it contradicts them. But anyway, I want to go now to the book of Matthew. And as I said, God will reach us in various ways because he's, he's going to leave us, in effect, without excuse in one sense. Although, on the other hand, as you know, he is giving people now a certain leash. You know, th this is not the time for most people to make their final choice, fortunately. But nevertheless, he is uh, witnessing to people in various ways so that they can't say that they, they, that they didn't have an opportunity to consider uh, the truth. Then in verse 16, Jesus uh, talks to the generation in his day, and he says, But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling uh, to their companions and saying, We played the, fruit, the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. The, the fruit of wisdom shows the value of it. You know, the fruit of God's way of life shows the, the value of God's way of life. And so, well, you know, we can criticize the messenger because we don't like the message, and we can find fault with the messenger. So God used different kinds of messengers. He used somebody like John the Baptist. Uh, who was a, a rather austere personality, and then he used, uh, the, uh, you know, the life of the party, as it were. God himself came, and uh, the, the amazing ironic thing is that God was re wasn't religious enough for some people. Isn't that uh, isn't it ridiculous? God himself was not quote unquote religious enough for some people. So anyway, uh, but he's going to reach one way or the other. So there, as I said, we got when you look read the Bible, there's all kinds of ways, various ways. Uh, to understand it in, in terms of just the impact. I mean, various ways to say to study it is what, I'm, what I mean to say. Various ways to study it and to uh, get involved with it. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about some of the, the uh, literary approaches that are used. And I want to first go to Luke 24 and verse 44. Uh, here you see that the, uh, the Bible, as the Jews have preserved it in the Hebrew Bibles, uh, is in three parts. And uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings, sometimes the term hagiographer is used, holy writings, or in Hebrew, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, or it's called Tanakh as an acronym, or the holy scriptures. They're also called, you know, Tanakh as an acronym, law, prophets, and writings. And in Luke 24 and verse 44, is the, uh, it says, says this about Jesus. Then he said to them, and then quoting Jesus, uh, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. You know, so uh, the Psalms in most Hebrew Bibles are the first book of the third section and a major part of that third section. Law of prophets and writings. Normally that the writings begin with the Psalms. So if you go to the, uh, the end of the Old Testament, which in a Hebrew Bible would be Second Chronicles, I want to show you how the, the second Chronicles ties in with Matthew so that a Jewish reader, if he had the entire Bible, it would make a lot of sense to go from Chronicles, which is a summary of the Old Testament, into, uh, into Matthew. And uh, the, the book of Chronicles, uh, let's say the later books of the Old Testament were written at a critical time in the history of God's church because there was a kind of counterfeit to the north. Jerusalem was the uh, center of the church, and it had... The, her the heritage of the Davidic monarchy from which would come the Messiah and the Levitical priesthood. On the other hand, in the north, uh, there were the Samaritans who had a kind of counterfeit. And so it was very important uh, in the, in the, at the end of the Old Testament to establish where God was working, that he was working uh, in Jerusalem. He was working through the family of David and, and the uh, family of Levi. And so this is the focus uh, in, in, in these latter books. 
you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles. And uh, I want to go to um, the beginning of Chronicles. And uh, here you see it begins with genealogy going back to the beginning. Adam, Seth, Enosh, and so on. And this is in Chronicles 1, you know, the first chapter. But then as you continue on, uh, very soon it focuses on the uh, the house of, uh, of Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah. And very er early on, you, you come to the family of David, because that really is the, because the Messiah is going to come from David. and uh, Ultimately, Jerusalem is going to be the, the world capital. So you have the genealogy of human beings, but then you've, the focus goes to Israel, and the focus goes to uh, Judah and to the family of David. And uh, if you look at uh, the book of Matthew, you'll find that it begins in the same way as Chronicles. I'm going to go now uh, quickly to... Um, and um, if you see how it begins... Um, The uh, book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you, it's, it's very much like Chronicles. And it starts with the genealogy. And the focus here, of course, is on the Davidic line and on the Messianic line. This is what the book of Matthew is establishing. And if you come to the, now I want to go back to Chronicles again, to the very end of Chronicles. And see how uh, it just uh, transitions over to the to the New Testament. At the end of the uh, of Chronicles. I'm in the 36th chapter, and I'm eventually going to get to the uh, last verse or so here. So here we have Cyrus, and I believe his, he's, and he's called by, by Isaiah, a shepherd. His name may, may have that meaning in, in, in that language, but Cyrus is called the shepherd, and Jesus Christ, of course, is the shepherd par excellence. Cyrus is a type of Jesus Christ. He, he uh, destroyed the Babylonian Empire. Jesus Christ will uh, destroy the end time Babylon. Cyrus uh, re restores the the Jews uh, and and uh, give commissions them to rebuild their capital and their temple, and so that's foreshadowing what Jesus Christ will do. And at the end of Second Chronicles, it says uh, this uh, this is a quotation about from Cyrus. Now, this is Second Chronicles thirty six twenty three. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the eternal God of heaven has given me. So you see, he's a type of Jesus Christ, who's going to be king of kings, lord of lords. And he has commanded me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now look at how it ends. Who is among you? Among uh, uh, who is among you of all his people? May the eternal his God be with him, and let him go up. Okay, this is how the Old Testament ends. Who is among you of, of all his people? May the eternal his God be with him, and let him go up. And then the next thing you read is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So you see how well it ties it ties in, and. Uh, here is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So it just, you know, flows right right into it. And uh, when you look at the book of Matthew, you find that the way the genealogies are organized are very interesting. Uh, in in uh, the 17th chapter of Matthew, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ, are 14 generations. So you actually have uh, three 14s is how these gene the genealogy is organized in Matthew. Well, why, why is it done that way? Uh, it's done that way. I'll show you in just a moment. If you go to Psalm 119, I may, some of you may have heard me cover this. I may have done this a couple of years ago for people in Iowa. I'm not sure if I went that direction or not. But if some of you were in Iowa a couple of years ago, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, at that time, the technology worked, worked better than tonight, so you could actually see me, I suppose. But anyway, Psalm 119, and this is an acrostic psalm, as you know, and that's one technique that's used in the Bible at times, where the Bible uh, organizes uh, uh, chapters alphabetically, uh, we would say in English, from A to Z. You know, the first uh, verse begins with A, the next with B, the next with C, the next with D, if you were talking about the, Amer the uh, alphabet we use. And our alphabet, of course, came from the Hebrew alphabet. And there you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, you know, and it went into the Greek alphabet, the Gamma, Delta. But if you go to the uh, Psalm 119, the first eight verses begin with Aleph, the next eight verses begin with Bet, and so on, to put two symbols, and 22 times 8 is 176. That's how many verses are there. Now, if you go to the uh, verse 25, you see that all those verses begin with the letter D, Dalet. 
And that's how David's name begins with a Dalit, and it also ends with a Dalit. There's one other consonant in his name, and that is is a W, which uh, modern Hebrew speakers pronounced as a pronounce as a V. So it's D D V D or D W D. And I want to go. His name is pronounced David in Hebrew. And I want to go now to um, to verse um, around forty or so here. Let's see. Uh, verse 41, and it says here in your Bible, "Wah." I guess some of you could say, wow, because you could really get excited about it. But it says, wah, and in modern Hebrew, we pronounce it vav. And so if you'll notice, that's the sixth letter. So you have uh, David's name is Dalid Vav Dalid. And that adds up to 14 because Dalid is equal to four. Remember, the Hebrew alphabet is also a numerical system. Dalit adds up to four, and there's two Dalits, so that's eight, and then Vav is six, that's 14. And now you see what's going on in Matthew 1. So there's a message to Jewish readers, because Jewish readers are into Gematria. Now, maybe other readers might not be, but Matthew was intended for a Jewish audience written in Greek, but in his day, many Jews uh, used Greek, just like many Jews use English today. If you went to America and were trying to work with the Jews, you'd have to use English. And in, in the days of the Apostle Paul, Many Jews used, you know, were speaking Greek. And uh, anyway, in, uh, it, it says in verse 17 of Matthew 1, So all the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the captivity to Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So you have three times. Remember, three times is a, is a decisive number. It's the number of the revelation of God's will. It's part of American culture, you know. One, two, three strikes, you're out. So in this case, you know, we say 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. So that's like saying, David, David, David. <laughs> you know, this is the Davidic line. This is the Messianic line. Um, now, if since we're in Matthew, I want to go to the third chapter. And here we see that Matthew was writing in Greek, but he was writing about events that were taking place in the, uh, in the land of Israel, where people spoke Aramaic, a Semitic language, and many of them had, had a background in Hebrew. It was Jewish Aramaic, so there was a certain amount of Hebrew there. And, and the learned ones, the, the scribes and Pharisees, would have known the Bible in Hebrew. The average person would have, would have uh, spoken Aramaic and would have needed a translation. But the learned ones would have, uh, were still speaking Hebrew. And uh, so you don't get to play on words in the Greek, but Matthew records it. And so the, uh, I want to go to Matthew 3. And um, here is where John the Baptist is preaching. And um, he sees, um, let's verse 7, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming uh, to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, he, you know, he's being some, uh, let's say he's being sarcastic with them because unfortunately they, they uh, deserved it, as we know if we keep reading the accounts. You know, if we read the Gospels, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now, if you understand Judaism, the, it's a very important principle in Judaism that, um, let's say, there's a differentiation between Jews and, and Gentiles based upon the principle of zechut avot, the merit of the patriarchs. The Jews have the merit of the patriarchs. They are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This means that they have a special obligation to keep the 613 mitzvot, and if they do, they have a, they have a very great reward. On the other hand, non-Jews who don't have the zechut avot, they only have seven commandments to keep, with the traditional seven commandments of the, uh, the descendants of Noah. And uh, so they get a reward, but not, not as good. And uh, they, even if they kept the 613 commandments, they still wouldn't get the reward that a Jew gets, because they don't have zehut avot, they would have to convert. They would have to become Jews. A man would have to be circumcised. A woman would have to, uh, you know, be immersed. Men and women are immersed, but men are also circumcised. And so, if with circumcision and immersion, and then acceptance of the uh, of the 613 laws, then they could become Jews, and then they would they would be obligated to keep those laws. And if they did, they have a great reward. Of course, if they they blow it, they're they're, they're, they're in trouble. But if they stay Gentiles, as I said, they, 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 there's a reward they get, but not as good. But on the other hand, they also don't have the, uh, 
the six of your 13 laws to worry about. You follow me on that? I hope I haven't gone, I hope it's not confusing. So anyway, the principle of the a vote is very important. And so look what he says here, though. He says in verse 9, And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Well, you don't get to play on words in English. You don't get to play on words in Greek. But if, if you're new to Hebrew Bible, you get to play on words. You, 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 you'll, back, you'll go back to the word for sons, which is banim. Banim are sons. And stones are avanim. It sounds very much the same. The Hebrew word for stones is aleph, bet, nun, yud, mem, avanim. And the word for sons is banim, bet, nun, yud, mem. So he's saying, I can take uh, avanim and raise up banim to Abraham. So it's a very interesting play on words. And as I said, you know, you can get the you can get the impact just reading it, but it's very powerful if you go back to, and realize what John the Baptist was doing here. And uh, this technique of using words that sound similar is paronomasia, and the Bible uses it. A, 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 a paro, yeah, paronomasia, P A R, and then I think uh, O N A M A S I A, right? Par, 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 uh, paron Paranomasia. Let me see. I'm sorry. Par should be paranomasia, right? P a r a n o m a s i a. Um, I may be misspelling it because I'm thinking off the top of my head here. Um, anyway, uh, let's. I want to go and show you some examples of that of paranomasia in um, in the book of Isaiah. It's very powerful. You can use it very powerfully. For example, in um, in the um, in the in the in the parlance of modern politics, some people say we don't want to go from ballots to bullets. It has a certain impact when you say that, right? And recently, Yahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, who knows the Bible very very well, his son won the won a Bible contest in Jerusalem. And I can tell you, if if I, I you would be, I think, dumbfounded if you knew what you ha- you know the what you have to know. <laughs> in order to win one of those Bible contests. And his son evidently was a winner of the Jerusalem Bible contest. So, you know, the, his family knows the Bible well. And so he understands this concept of paranomasia. And um, he was in front of the UN and he said, the UN was once a moral force and now it's a moral farce. <laughs> you know, so he had, the, that, that he understood that concept. And uh, I want to go to Isaiah 5 and verse 7 and uh, using a Hebrew Bible, show you some of the use of uh, paranomasia. Um, let's see, I'm going to verse 7. Um, for the vineyard of the eternal, I'm, I'm reading from a Jewish translation. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the seedlings he lovingly attended uh, are the men of Judah. He, he had, and he hoped for justice, but behold, injustice. So in Hebrew it says, he hoped for mishpat, and instead, Mispach. So it's a similar word. He wanted mishpach, justice. Instead, he got mispach, a, a flowing of blood, oppression. He wanted mishpach, he got mispach. And then it says, he looked for equity, tzedakah. The word for uh, charity uh, in Hebrew, righteousness, is tzedakah. And uh, in fact, there's a famous uh, composer. That was his last name. You may have heard of Neil Sedaka. Famous, uh, he composed a lot of his songs when I was young. Uh, anyway, he was looking for tzedakah, and instead he got tzedakah, a cry. It says, for behold, uh, he, uh, he, for, for he's looking for equity, tzedakah, and instead he got tzedakah, iniquity. You know, a, which re, uh, literally tzedakah means a cry. Um, you know, cry because people are, 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 are suffering from the wickedness around. So as I said, it, it still is powerful, but it's very powerful in the original because of, uh, uh, of the wordplay here. And uh, I want to now go to uh, Jeremiah and uh, look at the first chapter there. And uh, there we have also something interesting um, because we have in the, uh, should be in around the 12th verse. See, Jeremiah 1, verse 12. Um, We have wordplay here. Okay, let's see, Jeremiah 1. And um, he asked him, what do you see? It's in the 11th verse. Okay, let's see. Jeremiah 1, 11. Okay. 
The word of the eternal, I'm in verse 11 of Jeremiah 1, came to me. He said, what do you see, Jeremiah? He replied, I see a branch of an almond tree. You may remember that Aaron's rod uh, turned into a, you know, bl blossomed and had almonds. And uh, that, that's symbolic, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and he said, I see the branch of an almond tree. And uh, in Hebrew, the, uh, the almond is called shaked. And uh, that word as, as a verb means to be watchful, to be wake, wakeful, to be alert. Uh, the reason the almond tree is called the shaked is because it's the first tree that blossoms after the rainy season. It blossoms the, the earliest, uh, around uh, late January, early February. Uh, and so because it's the early blossomer, it's the wakeful tree, you know, it's the alert tree. So it's called a shakade. And you find that word in a very famous, at least to, used to sing a hymn, uh, unless the Lord, the city shields, the guards maintain a useless watch. That's the same word there, uh, the, the watch, you know. In other words, they, they're alert in vain if God doesn't guard the city. What God says here, he says, you see a shakade, and then he says, uh, you you have seen well, yeah, you have seen right, because shokade ani, because I am uh watchful, you know, I am alert, I'm watchful, I'm gonna do what I said I'm gonna do. You know, Jeremiah lived at a time when God was going to fulfill uh, his promises, prophecies and bring bring punishment on his on, on his people for their sins. So he said, You see a sh a shakade and almond tree, and I'm gonna be shokade, I'm gonna be alert and watchful and bring about these, the, you know, the, what, I, what, what I said. So again, it's, it's a very interesting uh, play on words there. Now I want to go to the book of Amos, and we sim see a similar one that also influences the New Testament. And um, so I'm going now to Amos, and I'm going to the eighth chapter of Amos. And uh, here you see he says, uh, this is what my, uh, my Lord Eternal showed me, there was a basket of fig. The word there is, is the word for summer. Uh, the figs are called summer because evidently that's when they, uh, they, 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 they come out in force. Uh, you know, they, they ripen in force in the summer. So your Bibles may actually say summer figs. But what's interesting about the word for summer in Hebrew, it's very similar to the word for end. You know, the word for summer very, sounds like the word for end. So look at what he says. He says, uh, I, I, there was a basket of figs. What do you see, Amos, a basket of figs? I replied, and the eternal said to me, the hour of doom has come for my people, Israel. And uh, probably some of your Bibles say the end has come. Um, that's what the, literally it's in the Hebrew. The, the, end, uh, the end has come uh, for my people. So the word for end is similar to the word for summer. And, and so it's a word play here. That, that a Hebrew speaker would see and it would have a very powerful impact on him. Now, Jesus uses this uh, concept in the New Testament in Matthew 24, the concept of the fig tree as a sign of the end, that same wordplay. But obviously, you're not going to get it uh, in, in, in the English or even in the Greek. But, you, but if you know the book of Amos in the Hebrew, then you, you'd get the, uh, the point. And I'm in Matthew 24. and um, let me see, uh, uh, I want to go to um, verse 32, okay? I hope you're with me, Matthew 24, verse 32. It says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And there's a play on words here because fig, the word for summer, and the word for end is very similar. So that's probably why he chose that. Why he chose a fig tree, uh, possibly because a fig tree shows that summer is coming, and the word for summer is very similar to the word for end. And of course, his his listeners would would have known that. You know, so it's it's very powerful imagery. But of course, there's more to it than that. And I want to go further now in the symbolism of the fig tree, if I may. He says, "Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near." This seems to be. Uh, symbolic of the end time that when you see a revival of judah uh that is a, an important sign that the end uh, is near uh in fact he, he also says uh in verse 33 uh so you also when you see all these things know that it is near at the doors 
Assuredly, I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away till all these things uh, take place. Well, this blossoming of Judah, I guess the question would be, when did that happen? And uh, one pers a person could argue in 1967, that tremendous, miraculous six-day war, when, when the Jews actually regained the biblical heartland, Judea, Samaria, and uh, reunified Jerusalem. And um, so evidently, uh, you know, we, a lifespan from that would possibly be the parameter that we're dealing with here. Um, but I want to go back and show you what Jesus did in, in Matthew 21. Uh, and around eight, verse 18 is where I want to go. Okay. Maybe in 22.18. Now let's go to 21.18. All right, let's go to Matthew 21.18. Are you there? Matthew 21.18. Now he's in Jerusalem. This is before his arrest and uh, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. Matthew 21.18. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road. Now this is the spring of the year. But it may be that by that time, some figs are already out there. Um, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. Now, this seems to be symbolic. Uh, you know, the Jews of his day, uh, they were exposed to his preaching. And yes, there were 120 disciples. And then later on, on Pentecost, 3,000 more, etc. But basically, the establishment rejected him, and the vast majority of the Jewish community rejected him. And so, in effect, you know, the, the, the torch passed to the apostles and to the New Testament church. And as we know from Romans 11, there's a period of time now where um, the Jews aren't playing the kind of role they played in the first century. Uh, they will again uh, in, in the future. But at the at, right, for, for, you know, for right now, the focus, you know, God's, God's work is being done you know, by, by those who are Jews spiritually, as we understand from Romans 2. So here he curses the fig tree. Now, another example of that you can find in uh, Luke 13. And um, and I'm going to go back to Jeremiah in just a moment to show you the basis of all of this. But I want to go to Luke, uh, Luke 13. And um, let's go to verse 6. He also spoke this parable. So it was a parable. So it was intended to be symbolic. It was a parable. Uh, a, man, a certain man had, in, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, uh, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it uh, use up the ground? Now, you remember Jesus Christ's ministry was about three and a half years. Uh, but he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also uh, uh, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Well, there was a, a, a period of time after Jesus' resurrection where, where where the disciples preached to the Jewish community. But as you know, the establishment rejected them uh, and the, uh, the community overall did. And within a generation of the resurrection, Jerusalem was destroyed, as the Jews will be commemorating very soon. Uh, you know, the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem destroyed, and the people scattered for, for 18 centuries. Now, I want to go back and give the basis of all of that in Jeremiah 24. Um, because there... Uh, okay. Jeremiah 24... Uh, the, um, okay, are you with me in Jeremiah 24? The Eternal showed me, uh, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Eternal. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Je Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths from, Babel, from Jerusalem, and brought them to Babylon. So God showed him what? Two baskets of figs. Uh, one basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket, very bad figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. When the eternal said, then the eternal said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I'm in verse 3. And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the bad, very bad, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Again, the word of the eternal came to me saying, thus says the eternal, 
you know, there's different ways you could, it's translated Lord here with all caps, right? yud Hey vav Hey Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, the Eternal. Uh, thus says the Eternal, the Lord, Adonai, Hashem. I'm, 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 I'm including everybody, right? Thus says the Eternal, the God of Israel. Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good unto, uh, into the land of the Chaldeans. So as I said in the beginning, there was a, there was a partial restoration. For I will see, I will set my eyes on them for good and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and, and uh, I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And, uh, and of course, this could be really going to the end time, ultimately. Then I will give them a heart to know, know me that I am the eternal and they shall be my people and I will be their God and they shall return to me with their whole heart. So that does seem to be, to be pointing to the, to the time when Jesus Christ returns. And he talks about the bad figs and talks about delivering them to trouble. I won't read the whole. I've made the point. Eight, eight and nine talks about the bad figs that are going to be punished. And uh, th that punishment, as I said, the Jews will be commemorated all through this, this midsummer time. The Jews are, are, are commemorating the, the, that period of punishment. You find the historical record, the second Kings 24 and 25, Jeremiah 52. Uh, you find the record there and at the end of uh, Chronicles. So you see that the figs sim symbolize Judah, and you have the good figs and the bad figs, and uh, the, the blossoming of the fig tree as a sign of the end time would seem to tie in. And in fact, there's a prophecy in, in, in Joel that ties in with that too, that I'll turn to. I'm going to t turn now to the third chapter of Joel. And, um, okay, Hosea, Joel. If you go to the third chapter of Joel, for behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, at that time, right, he, he, I, I read on, I will also gather all nations and bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means the eternal has judged, probably the Kidron Valley, you know, which is uh, west of the Mount of Olives. And I will enter into judgment with them there. So that, that's Jehoshaphat is again a word play because he talks about judgment. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. So over the years, of course, the people of Israel and Judah have had their, you know, they had their time of exile and the Jews have had their persecutions over the years. When they are regathered, there's a final end time battle. And so they need to be there organized for that to happen. So the, the fact that Judah is now an entity organized politically with a government, with an army, with, with, you know, with, 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 with some kind of national identity, that would seem to be a, a major milestone, a sign uh, on, on the way to, the, to uh, this, the climax of human history. I don't know how long I've gone. Maybe I've gone too long. But uh, there's one more thing I want to cover, and I, I won't cover as much as I wanted to cover, but I'll cover a little bit of it. And I want to go back to... Uh, the very beginning, the Genesis. And as I said, I don't know how long I've gone because uh, it reminds me of a story, maybe I've told it before, but there was this minister who was going on and on and on. And finally, he looked out at the congregation and he said, does anybody have a watch out there? And a, a, a little boy screamed, look behind you, you've, you've got a calendar. So maybe that's what I need. But I want to finish up uh, here and I'll go to Genesis 1. Uh, uh, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this uh, in the Hebrew is seven words. Very interesting. You know, you have the number of completeness. You begin the Bible, the first verse, it has seven words in the Hebrew. And also 28 letters, four times seven. And you know that four is used symbolically of the, of the whole earth. You know, and uh, so here we have seven times four, 28. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Seven words, 28 letters. And in the middle, uh, in, in the first three words, I'm, I'm sorry, after the first three words and before the last three, in the very middle is a little Hebrew word that is needed for grammatical purposes, and it is untranslated, but it is there. And that is the word Aleph Tav, Et. You know, Bereshit, but I, well, I don't have to say it in the Hebrew, but it's, it's the Hebrew word in the middle is spelled Aleph Tav, and it's used uh, for grammatical purposes, and it's untranslated. But it's interesting that in the very center of that verse, 
is Aleph Tav, a, a, a word that's spelled Aleph Tav, because Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So what we're saying is, you know, the very basis uh, of, of, of God's word is, you know, is God. You know, he is the basis of, 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 of what we, we, need, we need to be. You know, we, we ultimately want to be his sons and daughters, as we know. That's the very middle, middle word, Aleph and Tav. And um, what's interesting about it is that just as God is the Aleph and the Tav, in, in the Greek alphabet, he's pictured as the Alpha and the Omega. Now, let's go to the end of the Bible. And I want to tell everybody that the books of John tie up the loose ends. They finish the Bible. The Bible begins with Genesis, and if you read Genesis carefully and then read the writings of John, you'll see that he ties up the package very neatly, that a lot of what John writes about, you, you see in Genesis and other parts of the Old Testament, he's putting it all together, he's together, he's finishing the account. And so in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, we're finishing up what we read in Genesis. So look, notice that here in Genesis, we have the Aleph and the Tav, and by the way, in the Hebrew, that, that word Aleph and Tav, is between the word God and the word the heavens. We have, you know, in the Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim, God, et Hashemayim. And so in, in the beginning, since we have God, Elohim, and then we have that word in Aleph Tav, and then we have the heavens, Hashemayim, after. And so we have God and we have Aleph and Tav. Now, if we go to Revelation 1 and verse 8, notice God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who, who was and who is to come, uh, the Almighty. By the way, this is a very Jewish custom. Yes, he was, he is to come. Why is that? Because we don't want to, let, let's say that we were on our last, I was saying our last breath, say we were dying. We wouldn't want to die saying God was. First, we want to say God is. Then we can say he was and he will be. But the first thing we want to say is that he is. In case that's the last thing we say, that's kind of a Jewish idea. Anyway, so he is, he was, and he is to come. But now we go to the very end of the story. I go to Revelation 21 and verse 6. Let's go to Revelation 21 and, and verse 6. And uh, here we see, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give her the fountain of the water of life freely uh, to him who thirsts. And um, we have it also uh, in verse 13 at the end of the uh, story here, at the end of the account. Uh, verse, thir uh, verse 13, this is Revelation 22. I'm now in the last chapter of the Bible, so maybe it would be good for me to finish here. There's a lot more I could have said, and I have no idea of the time. And I know, I know some people are maybe collapsing, like, what is it, Eutychus that fell from the balcony? But I, I can't resurrect you, so stay awake. Okay, Revelation 22, 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So as I said, God is going to reach us in various ways. He can reach us just with the basic information, and he can also fascinate us with his use of numbers and letters and words, as, as I hope I've illustrated today in this talk. Uh, so uh, I want to finish by going to uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, the second chapter, Second Timothy 2. And so therefore, you know, we never really tire of studying the Bible. There's as all kinds of ways it can be studied, and we need to really know it well. Second Timothy 2.15, he says, be diligent. Second Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be able to know how to, uh, how to divvy up the, the verses, how to divide them up, you know. You put, one, put a scripture here, put a scripture there. You need to know how the Bible applies in your life. So we need to know it well. And so obviously that's why you're gathered tonight. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this has encouraged us to keep up with our Bible study. Uh, so this concludes my presentation. I hope it hasn't gone too long. Is, is there anybody out there? Yes, we're out here. Um, okay. Any questions or comments? Yep. Open it up for question. Um, normally, we would turn our webcam on, which you can do that if you like. Um, we are connected via phone tonight, so go ahead and uh, say who you are and fire a question. 
or comment. If not, uh, uh, there's one last, you know, a couple last things I could add. Uh, I think we got, no we got, uh, we'll give it a minute here and we'll see. Um, all right. Well, let me, let me give one more comment then while people are formulating their questions. Is that all right? How yes. long did I, did I go long? Did I go more than? No, uh, you were actually, you were actually right on pretty close. A little short, actually. All right. Compared all right. To let me give another... house, you were, you were really short. Yes, Gerald Waterhouse used to say, I have three points to cover, two hours per point. And at 10 o'clock, I serve coffee and donuts. He used to say something like that. Anyway, I want to go to uh, Genesis again and show you again something interesting. It says, in the beginning, God... And um, the end of, that wor of those first three words, those three words end in, in three Hebrew letters. The first, the first word in the beginning, but a sheet, and then bara, and then Elohim, those three words. They end with three Hebrew letters, which is Tav, Mem, and Aleph. All right? Now, those three letters are the, are the, the uh, letters of the word for truth, but they are not in the proper order in the beginning. And be, be, because you go to verse 2, that this is dealing with God uh, uh, taking, taking confusion and, and ordering it up. You know, the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the of the abyss. So what you start out with the truth, but the truth is is in a way garbled. Uh, but now you go to the end, and then when God rests on the Sabbath, in uh, verse four, sorry, in verse three, uh, then uh, then God blessed the seventh day, Genesis two three, and sanctified it because in it He rested from all His work which God had created to make. It should be He wanted to make a world, so He had to create. To make the world which God had created to make, but anyway, those three words end with Aleph, Mem, Tav. They end with the letters for truth in the proper order. So actually, by the time you come to the end of the account, God rests on the Sabbath, and we have the final uh, uh, passage. The, the last three letters, the, the last three words end with Aleph, Mem, Tav, the word for truth in the proper order. And what's interesting about the word for truth is that it is num numerically uh, a multiple of nine, it's 441, which is, um, eight, which is, um, it's, um, it's nine times a multiple of seven. I'm trying to think, um, if you, if you, I'm trying to think what the uh, multiple is, but it's actually, uh, a multiple of seven times, a multiple of seven, 49, I believe. Yes, I think it's 49 times nine is, uh, is, uh, 441. You know, so it's seven times seven, I believe, times nine. You can check me out on that. I believe it's, it's, it's 40, um, 40, 49 times nine, 441, all right? So it's completeness times nine. And um, the number nine is, is, is interesting because uh, it, it, it has a certain characteristic that when you multiply nine by another number, you come up with an answer, but then when you add the digits in the answer, it equals nine. Nine times three is twenty-seven. Two and seven is nine. You know, nine, uh, nine, uh, uh, nine times forty-nine is four forty-one. Four, four, one, or nine. And so, it, it, it's symbolic of the truth. It's symbolic of the truth. The truth through history is going to be garbled, twisted, distorted. But in the end, the truth will come out. So, all, in other words, when you multiply nine times something, you get a number. But you add up the digits, you find ultimately, ultimately wind up with nine. And this is how. And so, ultimately, the truth is going to win out. I think that's an uh, interesting concept, you know, uh, which which you find again implied uh, in this account in Genesis. So I thought I'd throw that one out as well. Okay, now now that I've provoked any questions, <laughs> well, I see Mike Waters has his microphone off. Hi, yeah, this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, good to good to hear you. <laughs> yes. By the way. By the way, can can all of you hear me? Only Mike. Everybody. Everybody can hear me. I want to make a comment because this is related to Mike. Um, uh, uh, years ago, I saw an ad by a, a a group that was trying to convert Jews, and they spelled uh, Jesus' name in a very unusual way. 
and it gave me the impression that this is what the Messianics were teaching, but I was incorrect. So I, I made an issue uh, uh, some months ago of how Messianics pronounced Jesus' name, and that was incorrect. You know, Yeshua is fine. Uh, yeah, the, the reason I, I, I made that issue was my mistake, and Mike was correct at the time, but the reason I made that mistake had to do with an ad I saw years ago by a group that really is not that prominent anymore. Uh, and but, but but the uh, way the Messianics pronounce Jesus' name is is fine, and I'm sorry I made the comment, and you know, so I just wanted to apologize for that. But but to defend myself, <laughs> it had to do with something I saw many years ago. Anyway, now Mike, now that I've given you this this new aura of respect, Mike, go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> well, I, I I have a comment which uh, you can verify, but. What I always tell people about the Hebrew, uh, the Masoretic text of the Torah, is that it's so uh, symmetrical in like the ways that you were just talking about, that you just don't see that symmetry in regular literature, you know, or even other parts of the Bible, that the, the Torah is so symmetrical that it's just, it, it, to me, it's just fascinating. And, and, and if you're off by one letter, even it'll throw the symmetry off throughout, you know, it, you know, counting, doing the counts backwards and forwards, you know, the middle letter of the Torah, the, the middle uh, book of the Torah, the middle verse of the Torah, you know, that it's all so symmetrical. And, uh, and maybe I'm over, Stating it, what 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 do you think about that concept of the the incredible symmetry of of the Masoretic Torah? There do seem to be certain patterns that are working there in the text, like every so many letters, uh, you know, spell out a word or that sort of thing. Uh, some people have taken it too far, and they tr they try to find Bill Clinton in there and all the rest of it. You know, that, that seems to have died out. That was a very big fad about 10 years ago or more, 20. Uh, you know, but, but see, you can play a lot of games with Hebrew because if you're using words that aren't Hebrew words, you can spell them different ways and you can have a lot of fun with it. And you can go overboard, you know. But it's, but, but, but it's true that there do seem to be certain numerical patterns working in, in, the, in the Torah, which means that if you, if you didn't have the letters quite that way, it, it would mess them up. So that could get to this probably a valid point now now if you look at a masoretic text they counted each letter very carefully they were very careful and precise at the end of each book they tell you how many this and how many that there's statistics there at the end of each book that that the in a, in a masoretic text you see uh, I, I forget just all the details that they give you but i think they give you how many words and and you know so forth at the end of each book there's there's statistics that they give and they counted, they were very, very careful to, to, to do all that, you know. Um, so that, that, that's a whole other, you know, a whole other discussion. But I, I, would, I would agree with you. But on the other hand, some people do take it, you know, a bit beyond. And, and they try to kind of play games with it and, 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 be, and, and try to make predictions and so forth. So we have to be careful. We don't get superstitious about it. But I, I, I would say your comment's valid from the point of view that there are numerical patterns that were found even before the computer age. Rabbis who studied the, the books very diligently found that every so many words you might have a letter, and then every so many words another letter, and, be, before, and after a while it spells certain words that are significant. They have found patterns like that. And, that, and in the computer age now we've found more. So that would validate your comment. Yes, and as then long as, as we don't say, take it, it actually as as we, uh, adds up numerically, also. Like like you were just saying. Well, that I have that that I haven't done, but <laughs> but uh, now in this computer age, I'm sure people are, are doing all kinds of things. But the main thing is not to to get hysterical and think that you can predict who's going to win the next election or something, you know, because pe you know people uh, you know uh, want to want to do that sort of thing. I mean, the, the, the basis, the Bible is there to, as a, to give us a way of life. And it's not necessarily, you know, there to be, to be used, uh, it, it, you know, in, in these other ways. Yes, there is prophecy in the Bible, but, you know, but, the, but the real focus is, 
you know, the moral instruction, how you ought to live, the purpose of life, and how and how to go from point A to point B. And yes, prophecy is there, but um, people people tend to have what you know. Now, the WCG for a while was talking about prediction addiction. You know, they took that too far and kind of did away with prophecy. You know, so they went to the other extreme. But on the other hand, there is such a thing as prediction addiction. Some people do uh, attempt to uh, to um, you know, kind of you know, think that they have some kind of secret insight into what's going to happen. Uh, and um, when major events happen, you're not going to need to get a, a special newsletter. I tell people this a lot because it's a personal problem, a personal, what's, what's the right word, a issue of mind. When, when events start to happen, when World War II, for example, began, you didn't need a special newsletter or some, or some preacher to tell you the world was at war. You got up the morning and you read the newspaper. And that's and, and when major events begin to happen, you're not gonna you're not gonna be part of some insider group that knows and other people don't know. That's not I mean the prophecy isn't there so that a few people know and the others don't. You know, when these events start happening, they're gonna be impacting the whole world and people are gonna know uh that, that these problems are happening. Uh, so in the past there were there were there were some people that were, were, were kind of in these insider groups reading reading reports and making all these predictions, it means that other people were just going on with their lives. And the years went by, the decades went by, and here we are in 2017, you know. And, and so, as I said, when the time comes for prophecy to be fulfilled, you're not going to need necessarily, you know, special newsletters or, or special uh, websites that tell you. On the other hand, it is true that to understand, you know, biblical revelation and what God has in store for the church, you know, you do need you know, God's guidance and direction uh, in that regard. And I would say this, you know, I would believe that as we get closer to those events, it will become more clear to, to, to God's people, uh, you know, what uh, you know what, what the perspective ought to be, where we stand, when, it, when it's necessary for us to know, because he does tell us that, you know, in John 14, um, um, uh, John 15, if you don't mind, I'll go there. Um, um, uh, John 15, around verse 12, I think it says. Um, he says in verse uh, in verse 15. No longer do I call you servants. This is verse uh, chapter 15, verse 15 of John. Okay, uh, this is in response to Mike's comment. Uh, John fifteen fifteen. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. So he says, you're my friends. You know, so I'm going to let you know what I'm, going, what I'm doing. Just like God said to Abraham in Genesis 18, I'm not going to hide from you what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to let you know about it. And so as we get closer to the times, I believe that, that, that those who are serving God faithfully will will we'll, we'll know what they need to know. Anybody else have any comment or question? Yeah, yeah Dr. Kaplan, uh, Rod Kuzman here in uh, Maryland. Wow! Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, speaking of letters in the Torah, have you ever read uh, Elliot Friedman's book, Who Wrote the Bible? And, and, and he, he, there's a lot of people who believe the Bible was not so much written by, or the Torah wasn't so much written by Moses, but instead various people to whom they ascribe various letters. And, and, and he seems so sure about it and everything. And maybe not going that to that extent. Is there any wisdom in that, looking at different parts of it? Of, of it that, that might be influenced well, you know, by the, these letters. The issue of textual criticism uh, has, be, you know, became very important, beginning particularly in the 19th century in Germany, and then from then on, you know. So there are different ways to to understand the Bible, and people who do not believe in it as as a as a holy text, but just study it as 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 a, as a historical document. They have what they call the documentary hypothesis that there were four levels of of um, of, of writings, and uh, they have their basis for why they believe that, and that's what people study in universities. Um, 
but I would say that uh, that's their, in my opinion, that's what you would call their spin on it. I think if you if you look into the documentary hypothesis, you can find conservative scholars who will, who will find flaws in it. Liberal scholars will, of course, want to defend it because they want to deny the authority of the Bible. Conservative scholars, on the other hand, will, will show the flaws in the documentary hypothesis. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't some editing that took place. Um, uh, for example, in, in Genesis 14, there may have been editing there. Uh, so, uh, but I'll just go to that one example without taking up a lot of time because some of you must be exhausted by now. Uh, in, in Genesis 14, when it talks about Abraham pursuing the kings, um, let's see. Um, Abraham, or let me just see where the kings, I think it's in the, is it in the 14th verse of, of Genesis 14? Um, yes, Genesis 14, 14, all right? It's easy to remember. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in, in pursuit as far as Dan. Well, uh, that may very well be an edit because it may be that the original location in the text, you know, later on we wouldn't we wouldn't know where it was, uh, you know, because you know the name was changed to Dan. In fact, there's a scripture in Genesis, uh, in Judges 18, about that. I believe how they how they conquered a city and changed the name to Dan. Uh, and so they they it could be this is an edit, uh, but you know, but you know you can have edits like that for for for, lo- for place names to keep the the information uh, usable, but. Uh, but as far as the concept of, of la- different layers of documents, uh, that's what a liberal would say, you know, who doesn't really want to to have the Bible be an authority in his life. But a conservative scholar would believe these are the five books of Moses. That's what they claim. That the Bible itself says that the five books were the five, five books of Moses. Jesus says that, you know, I mean, the, the Bible itself claims that this is mosaic. Uh, you know, so even if there's later editions, I believe, for example, the latter part of Deuteronomy 17, I believe, was added by Samuel. Samuel had that authority to do that. I believe he added the end of Deuteronomy 17. You could disagree if you want, but Samuel had that authority. But if you study the documentary hypothesis, I think you'll find that conservative scholars have, have rebuttals of it. And as far as who wrote the Bible, a lot of books come out like that because once you, you know, don't believe that God inspired the Bible in the, in the very direct sense, once you don't believe what the Bible says about itself, then you can have all kinds of creativity, and this is what people want to do in universities. They want to study, they want to, you know, have some novel idea, or they want to get grants to do studies, or they want to get good grades, or whatever it is, you know, or they want to get a reputation. So various, you know, people are going to play around, you know, and I don't mean, I don't mean in disparagingly, but this is how scholarship works. Like people argue whether Shakespeare wrote his plays, and on and on it goes. You know, once you take the Bible and make it a, a, just a book like others, then you can do all kinds of things with it, you know, because you're not, you, you don't feel any, any restriction. But if you have a certain amount of faith that it's divinely inspired, and then, you, then you'll, you'll take it for what it says, you know, and, and, and Jesus does say Moses, uh, wrote, you know, uh, wrote these books, and the, and the books themselves say that, you know, regarding the, the Bible books. But, but scholars are going to have all kinds of ideas because they don't have that, that same basis. They, since they don't believe in it in the same way a, a religion, a, a person of faith would, they, they, they would, they have their, they can do their scholarly uh, interpretations. And uh, I'm not saying that it's not, that it's, it, I'm not saying it's useless to read that, but I'm just saying that's the difference. The difference is how you come to them. believe that as, as the second Timothy says, that all scripture is, is, is inspired and, and it's, and it's worthwhile for, you know, to, to, uh, for, for instruction and correction. Or do you take it as uh, literature like Shakespeare or whatever, and then you you analyze it that way? It has to do with what attitude you're bringing to the discussion. By the way, you were in Tennessee two years ago, so come to Pigeon Forge if you feel like it. <laughs> you were in Maybe Washington, so. D.C., but you, you had been yeah. in Tennessee before. Then you came to D.C. and you were with us there. No, no pressure, no pressure. Go wherever, you know, wherever the spirit moves you. No, no pressure. <laughs> um, 
We have a comment in the chat room that says, uh, "Okay, this is from James Rudd. The document the, the document theory clearly states that by Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible, right. showing the mm -hmm. Bible was not godly authority." I could mm -hmm. not agree with Mark more. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Let me, let me, for the sake of, of Mr. Rudd out there, where does he, does he live in Wisconsin? Uh, Colorado. Oh, wow. All right. Well, anyway, let me say something to, to, you know, to, uh, if I may, um, since, since Mr. Rudd is out there, I want to go to Exodus 12 and verse 37. And first, let me say, while I'm doing that, that you know in Acts 7, uh, Moses' life had three uh, 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 three phases. Forty years, uh, the, the Egyptian prince. Forty years, the shepherd. Forty years, the shepherd of Israel. And so his life was 320 years and uh, three forties, which, as you know, is God's number of trial. But the 120 uh, fits in as his lifespan because Moses, in effect, was the founder of the church as we know it. You know, the, the old covenant uh, was given there. In, in, in Exodus, and we have in Acts 7, verse 37, 38, that Moses w was with the church in the wilderness, as it's called in one translation. So he's, in a way, the founder of the church as we as we know it, and, and he lived 120 years, and 120 is the, is the, as you know, 12 is God's number of organized beginnings, and regarding the church, 120 is symbolic of the church, and I want to show you that in three examples, and I want to, this is in honor of Mr. Rudd. The first is Exodus 12, verse 37. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. By the way, that means booths, as you know. About 600,000 men on foot besides children. Why does it round it off to 600,000? To make a point, 600,000 is uh, 5,000 times 120. So 120 is the basis of the of the of the symbolic of the church. Now let's go to Ezra 2 and verse 64. When they come back again, this is the second Exodus, and it's in Ezra 2 and verse 64. And now they're coming back from captivity, the second Exodus. And um, okay, I, you know, there's different orders of books in the Bible, so I have to remember where I am. I'm now in a New King James. So okay, so Ezra's going to come before Nehemiah and after Second Chronicles. So I go to Ezra 2 and verse 64, and when they come back from Babylon, what do you find, the number given here? Uh, 264 of Ezra, it says, the whole assembly together was 42,360. That's 120, again, times 353. Now, when they came back from captivity, why did they come back? Because they're setting the basis for the coming of Christ. He comes to his own people. He comes, he comes to the temple. And guess what? You can Google this. Uh, some people in, 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 in listing all the miracles of Jesus Christ, or all the prophecies he fulfilled, rather, all the prophecies that he fulfilled were 353 in his ministry. I have seen a list like that. Now, you could argue how to categorize them, but if you Google it, you'll find a list of all the things Jesus did that fulfilled prophecy, and it comes out to 353. And 353 times 120 is, is the figure given in Ezra 264. Now we want to go to the book of Acts. And the New Testament church begins, and now I go to Acts, and now I go, I believe, to the 16th verse of, or so of Acts. Am I, uh, am I in Acts 1? Um, let me see. Maybe a little bit later than that. Is it around verse 20, 21 or so? Uh, let me see. Um, uh, there's a figure here given of the, of the uh, yes. Um, Let's see, uh, I'm in Acts 1, and I want to go to where, where the figure is given of the, uh, of the, of the uh, disciples. Uh, 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 I thought it was in verse 16, but I'm not seeing the, uh, the numbers. But if you, uh, I'll get there in just a moment, but it's in Acts 1. If, you've, if somebody finds it before me, go ahead and... Tell me which what it is. I'm just going to go quickly through Acts one. Okay, um, heard and and they were uh, the twelve apostles were there. They all continued in prayer. Yeah, here we go. One fifteen. Yeah, I was about right. 
Let's go to Acts 115. Everybody should be there by now because I took too long to get there. I apologize. In those days, Peter stood up in, in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. Wow. So again, the church begins with 120. And guess what? 3,000 are converted um, in one day. And that's also a multiple of, of 120. I believe it's 25 times 120. And there's a significance to that that I won't get into. But even the 3,000 is a multiple of 120. Now, let's come to the end of the story. And Re Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, the 144,000, that's also a multiple of 120, right? I believe it's 1,200, right, times 120. So even the 144,000 is a multiple of 120. So you see, all through the Bible, that's symbolic of the church. 120 is symbolic of the church. So you see, there's patterns and themes working through here that if you take the time, you notice them. And as I said, this, as I said, God reaches us on various levels. So if that, if that interests you, you can get into it. If it's, if it's if, you know, some people are interested maybe in other things. Maybe they want to study the tabernacle and all the different details. Maybe they're into architecture. But, you know, whatever you're, int into, whatever you're interested in, the Bible has something for you. So I hope that Mr. Rudd enjoyed that. I think he did. <laughs> good, good. Um, if he did, typing, I'm happy. He's typing more here. Okay. Um, right. Mark, the 120 mentioned in Acts 2 is families, not individuals. So like 500 people or so. Can you expound? I agree with that. I agree with that, but the reason the Bible uses 120 is symbolic. You see, it's, it's, not, a, it's not supposed to be necessarily an exact census. It's giving you, a, 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 it's giving you the, the fact the church is beginning. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The number is also a concept. That's, that's why it says around 600,000 in the other verse. It's giving you a concept. See what I'm trying to say? It's being used symbolically. Not that it's incorrect, but it's, just, it's, it's, but it's being used symbolically. I do believe you're right that it was about 500. And in fact, you, you know later, it says he appeared to about 500 people in 1 Corinthians 15, right? It says that. I'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. He appears to 500 people. Um, Around the third verse or so, First Corinthians 15, um, which possibly was the seventh day of unleavened bread, but um, uh, uh, verse six of First Corinthians 15. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. First Corinthians 15:6. So I agree with you. The 500 could be the 120 plus family, right? Whoever said that, you, you, you okay? Are you, you agree with me, or <laughs> you're willing, willing to at least entertain the idea? Um, he he says thanks for the explanation. That's what he was interested in. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, well, I hope this hasn't been. Uh, what's the right word? I hope I didn't just pile a lot of statistics on you. You know, back back in 1970, again when I was in Jerusalem. Uh, I was with a fellow who was teaching French uh, in Brickett Wood, and we were take, talking about all these technicalities. So he told me, why don't you put out a booklet, what you don't need to know about the Bible. But actually, you know, I, I, I feel like this is worthwhile information. I enjoy covering it. I mean, he was joking, obviously, anyway. Well, I have one last call for questions. Or comments? I have a question. Okay. Was my answer to the, was my answer to these questions recorded? Yes. Good. Okay, I appreciate that. Everything is recorded. I don't know how it's going to turn out because it's going to be recorded as MP4. So <laughs> an MP4 <laughs> is a video file. So we'll see what happens here. Um, All right. Well, sorry that you know for the technical difficulties. It probably had to do with the uh, our our uh, our company that that services us here in Central Florida. I think that 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 may be the issue. That's what my son my son Jonathan is here, and he's saying it, it has to do with you know the, the company the company that's servicing us here. So maybe we can work on it for next time. If there is a next time, you know, we'll hopefully it'll work out better. 
Yeah, there will be a next time unless you don't want to speak to us no more. <laughs> All right, great. Okay. So hopefully by then we we can you know we'll have worked it out. Okay, well if there's no other comments, um I'm going to I will